Good evening, and welcome to another edition of Sullivan Says Live at Five. I'm Jerry Sullivan. I'm the chief columnist and founder of Sullivan Says SoCal.com, and I'm glad you could join us tonight. Um, this evening's discussion will be about media and how it's covering LA and what's going on in LA and, and touch on some of the recent uh, revelations of public corruption in LA. And I, I recently actually spent some time in uh, New York, in Manhattan, and had a chance to uh, run every morning in uh, Central Park. And it occurred to me that I recall a time when Central Park, which is probably the most fantastic public amen amenity in the United States, uh, but I recall a time when it was almost uh, being abandoned for use over neglect and fears of crime and perceptions of a lack of public safety. And of course, this is before Manhattan and New York experienced a great turnaround in the 1980s and 90s. Um, but it occurred to me, I wondered, you know, how long had New York been in some sort of gradual decline before Central Park was seem to be slipping into a state of almost disuse. It must have been a long, gradual decline. And I'm guessing maybe somewhere from the end of World War II through the, the 80s. Um, and it's hard to tell sometimes when you're in a somewhat gradual decline, I suppose. Um, and then one day the city wakes up and Central Park is deemed a dangerous place, which is just a, a, was a terrible shame. And of course, it's great that it's been reclaimed to a large degree uh, for public use. It made me wonder about Los Angeles uh, because I see many parts of Los Angeles, uh, the aspect of public use uh, falling away and uh, you know attempts to try and reclaim public space. Uh, they're ch challenged by uh, social conditions that just aren't being met and you have to wonder and uh, wonder why this job isn't getting done. And so I have a couple um, panelists today, journalists, uh, Rick Reef, a Pulitzer Prize winner, and he's currently the editor-at-large of the Orange County Business Journal, and Rob Ashman, the national editor for The Forward, both uh, two of Southern California's finest journalists. And so I wanted to have a conversation with them and, and just talk about get their views uh, on coverage and, uh, and, and what's going on. So welcome today. Hey, welcome. Hey. Good to see you again, Rob. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think the last time the last time uh, uh, we spoke, uh, you were on my show, uh, 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 SoCal Insider. It was uh, it was um, 2013, and we were trying to make the Wendy Gruel Eric Garcetti mayoral race exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we succeeded. But. <laughs> well, let's you know. Let's talk about the results of that. <laughs> Well, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. looking back, one of the problems was I don't. I think you maybe uh, you know it would have been hard to slip a sheet of paper in a gap, uh, you know, uh, as far as what they stood for and everything. And you know, uh, maybe maybe uh, LA would have benefited from uh, uh, you know a little more diversity of viewpoints, perhaps of people. Running. Maybe maybe a better debate back then might have produced a, some better outcomes now, but. Uh, at any rate, we are we do seem to be mired in corruption. And what I want to do is run through some headlines here. And so, Gary, could we bring up the first one, give everyone a look, and let's just chat about it. Another blow to stability at City Hall. Now, to me, I look at that, and this has to do with uh, the recent indictment of Council Member Mark Ridley Thomas. Um, I don't know what uh, is deemed, this is from the Los Angeles Times, by the way, I don't know what they deem stability to be or if uh, a stable, corrupt system, and not that Mr. Ridley Thomas has been convicted, but there have been some guilty pleas out of City Hall. So the, the matter of corruption is established. Um, so is that, is that stability or stasis or, or what is it? Rob, how do you see it? You've covered Los Angeles a long time. It's a weird headline. Um, like you said, I, I, I guess it's stability, but first of all, like you said, do do is stability at City Hall such a positive? I mean, isn't it? Don't we want to see more change and more positive change there? And um, you know, if stability at City Hall results in what the policies we're seeing now in LA or the condition of LA now, then then it's, I don't think "blows" the right word. Um, 
but you know, Mark uh, Ridley Thomas, he's got this long, you know, 40 year history in politics. And this, the news that, I mean, the indictment or the right now came after, I think three years after an LA Times investigation. So none of this was news to the LA Times. None of it should have been news to the people, his, his people sitting in the council with him. Um, and it just is strange to me why it took so long um, for these charges to come up and for action to be taken. Rick, what do you think? You, 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 well, you I, I think yeah, I, the, the, uh, the implication of the headline, I think both of you touched on it, is that uh, how sad that corruption is depriving us of our stability <laughs> or, of uh, you know, it's, it's interfering with the status quo or, or, or uh, something like that. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. It's... It, uh, I think so much of the coverage in in the Times, I guess I'll just pick on the L.A. Times because they're the, uh, you know, 2000 pound gorilla. But just the media in general in L.A., the reporters seem to be stenographers. You know, they're just uh, they're waiting for um, uh, prosecutors to file charges. Otherwise, everything's, you know, off off limits or we're not concerned about it. And the commentators are all apologists, you know, so you've got bas basically, <laughs> you know, and so uh, rather than saying, holy cow, uh, there's been bad stuff going on. It's more like, oh, my gosh, let's wring our hands. This is terrible. These people that we love and we admire and they've done so many good things are now in trouble. And what's this going to mean for, uh, you know, our uh, going forward? And <laughs> it, it seems like the corruption is there and it's almost accept it as a given and it's apologized for well i think that's uh, a, that's a little, little bit a little <laughs> further with 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 uh, uh you know some of the other stories we're going to discuss but uh you know it's kind of a theme that runs through all the news go ahead rob i have a little bit of a different take i think you know the la times did bring up some of these issues a few years ago um i know that steve lopez called him on the carpet for seven hundred thousand dollars in taxpayer money that he spent on i think redecorating his office or some crazy stuff um the you know i i don't blame it's certainly not individual journalists at the time some of whom are superb um i i think a lot of it is um the city council itself i mean the culture in the city council itself um, not having enough of a watch, not having a built-in watchdog function and not having enough accountability in the political system. And I'm not, I don't think you could really hold the journalists of the LA Times. I mean, maybe you could hold some of the TV journal, local TV journalists, you know, accountable because there really is so little hard hitting reporting at that score on, the, on you know, of the city council um, there. But I, I think it's really, the council has to own this, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, I would probably fall somewhere between the two of you. That, that headline, to me, was written in a bubble. So I cover City Hall. I know what a stable City Hall looks like from an internal perspective. And this shakes that up. It's no longer stable. If, you, if you're inside City Hall every day, uh, this is now unstable. I don't think it has any outside perspective of the people, the, the readers, and the community they're supposed to serve. Um, because a corrupt government is not stable, you know, in any good way. And I, did, I just felt like that just the premise that it bought into was very indicative. Uh, I also, I don't mean to pick on the LA Times. A, a number of these examples will come from them. And I don't really want to get into any of the individual journalists. Um, uh, and, you know. Well, that's not, that's also not the journalists. Those are the headline writers who are different. That's true. There, there is a, yeah, there's a difference there. That, you know? it, I, it's been a while since I read that particular story, but I remember thinking it was a pretty good story. But, you know, the headline needed work, but, you know, yeah. I'm not holding them responsible for it. The, um, well, I, so we'll put it on the door of the institution, right? It's a newspaper. It's whether it's a reporter, editor, but they, they put out the paper and, and yeah. uh, you know, the institution is responsible for it. I also would say that, you know, the 2000 pound gorilla has lost some weight, but you know, still, it is still the, the, you know, the, the LA Times is still significant as the, I guess the single largest uh, media outlet in the region. So, you know, there, there, there is reason to discuss their coverage. Absolutely. I would say they're down to a couple hundred pounds. The, um, why don't we bring up the next headline and see what everyone thinks of this. Some real baggage for a city hall heavy hitter. Now, case against Ridley Thomas 
could slow fight against homelessness. You know, I, my view on this is, I don't know that anybody's a heavy hitter on homelessness in Los Angeles. And I don't know how anyone can look at the results of the billions of dollars that have been raised and spent to address this and call anyone a heavy hitter. Okay, so I, I, I do not hold Steve, I, I'm a big fan of Steve Lopez. I do not hold him responsible for that headline or the subhead. Um, Fair enough. Uh, what was the, the subhead's ridiculous. I mean, it can't slow the fight against homelessness because you couldn't fight it any slower than we fought it. I mean, how, what do you, how slowly can you fight it? You know, people are, you know, the city council has been trying to blame COVID for the amount of homelessness, but I, re I was alive before COVID and I remember just how terrible it was in 2018, 2019. People were, you know, shouting and screaming to do something about it. You know, it was the, the election we were talking about between um, Garcetti and Wendy Gruel. Homelessness was the biggest issue then. So you can't fight it any slower. I don't see how, the ridiculousness of the headline. Um, and it's not and it's not borne out in what he actually wrote. But the ridiculousness of the headline is that somehow one ineffectual person's demise, political demise is going to somehow impact 12 other ineffectual people. Rick? Um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I again, I'm, I'm going to segue a little to how the how the media is. Going <clears> up. It's true. I mean, uh, if anything, homelessness is worse. Uh, all the money that's been, been put into it, all the initiatives and the problem keeps getting worse. And and again, I think that there's been a failure of just journalism in general in in, uh, in addressing homelessness to kind of step outside the box and not just accept kind of what government has created, which is a zero sum game. Uh, first of all, it becomes an industry now. So, uh, you know, I, I th it's been long, long past that I've heard anybody suggest that the main job of government should be to eliminate homelessness. OK, let's just get rid of it. Homelessness is not a good thing. It's not good for the homeless. It's not good for the neighborhoods. It's not good for anybody. And, and but it's, what it's become is interest. So now so much of the media focus is on which neighborhood's going to have to bear these people. Now they're cleared out here. They're going to go here. They have rights. Homeless people have rights. Neighborhoods want their rights. And it becomes this pitch battle. And, and that's a different, yeah. And that's failure to, to really address the problem. And I think journalists should go beyond kind of step out of the government, this government agenda that's set up and talk to people that are actually working in homeless shelters. Well, let me, let me interrupt you there because um, Rob did. And I think a couple of years ago, Rob wrote an op-ed that to the LA Times credit, I believe they ran it <clears throat> with a suggestion about that, that was out of the box. And it was about, I believe, a patch of land over near LAX. Mm -hmm. And the LA Times did run it to their credit. You did write it. Uh, to your credit um, and the forwards credit. Um, could you just walk us through that? What happened? Yeah, this was a case exactly what Rick is talking about. I, I, I submitted this idea to Sue Horton, who at that time was the editor of the op-ed pages. And it was this crazy idea that, that it was actually somebody I interviewed, a, a community activist had to erect a homeless a village for the homeless as had been done elsewhere in the country. Um, in land that the city owns at LAX. It's about 80 acres, some of which maybe 35 or more is available for the city to build on. And it, it was kind of an outlandish idea. And to her credit, Sue Horton said, it's time for out of the box thinking exactly what Rick was saying. I mean, she basically said exactly what Rick is saying. Um, so they ran it. I got, of course, immediate pushback from Mike Bonin, who is the 11th district councilman, um, and from some other people. Uh, and yet the idea, I got tremendous, you know, positive feedback from people who don't want to see people living on the streets because it's not good for the neighborhood and it's not good for the people living on the streets. And this seemed to be a good solution. So flat, uh, flash forward, what, two, three years, because I wrote this pre-COVID. Um, and Mike Bonin is now suggesting using LAX property to put up a homeless village. So you know, I, I think the power of that is when you do step out of the box, eventually, it, you know, reality catches up to you. Um, yeah, and, and you really do need to think, we really do need to have more opportunities for people to do that and to encourage politicians to do it. 
Yeah, and, and kudos to you, Rob, for doing that. And and Jerry, I'll I'll give you I'll give you some kudos because I don't think anybody in Los Angeles is covering the the waste and the uh, and and the corruption in uh, homeless programs like 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 you've been doing. And uh, you know, you're uh, you're calling attention to that uh, the city overpaying for a homeless shelter that hasn't even been set up yet. In other words, they're paying rent and it's over yeah. market rent. And the yeah, yeah, yeah. final year wasn't even, uh, it was empty while right. homeless people are literally dying outside the doors of this place. And that's powerful stuff. And I'm just saying that, you know, uh, if the LA Times, uh, you know, if, you know, there's there's Eshman and, and Sullivan, I right, take that, maybe multiply it by three and have six reporters that don't necessarily have to always be working on homelessness, but their, their antennas are always up and they're looking for those kinds of stories, I think that could have a huge, a huge difference because it could then, you know, prod citizen action to get the uh, to get the uh, uh, politicians off the dime. And I'll just note that uh, Rick is a Pulitzer Prize winner, and I actually, I actually, uh, sorry about that. I uh, I worked under Rick and trained under Rick as a managing editor, and I can tell you that his ideas for coverage make sense. Um, so. Okay, so now we've all complimented each other, right? Yes. So. <laughs> the, uh, now that 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 uh, homeless <laughs> shelter uh, you mentioned that I've been covering on Paloma Street, it's really fascinating because I think if you tear it apart, as I've been doing, almost every aspect of the problem intersects there. The county, the city, the uh, dealings with landlords, uh, some very uh, uh, patently corrupt uh bids or, or uh, com comparisons they worked up to justify the price. Um, so it's all there and uh, interesting stuff. Has, uh, Terry, has that story been picked up elsewhere in the print or broadcast media? No, and it's all on record. You, you can, you know, it's all on record. It's all there. I, I certainly have done my bit to, uh, <laughs> to amplify it. Um, I actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I should say, uh, some radio. I did a radio spot uh, a couple weeks ago and, and things like that. So it's been amplified a bit, but no, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, I think it's a little too inconvenient for too many people. Um, the, um, to really, I, I really think uh, we're in a catch 22 with the legacy media that to really cover it well is to admit you are asleep for 10 years and nobody wants to go down that road. Now, Rob's fairly pointed out the disconnect between a headline and the actual text and that the, the person, that wrote, the journalist who wrote the story isn't always one who wrote the, uh, the headline, which may draw castigation. But um, this next one, I want to show you, they're completely in sync. So, uh, Gary, could we show the next one? In L.A., at least corruption won't empower. Um, this has got to be one of the most... Uh, egregious examples of everybody's doing it as a justification uh, that I've seen in a while. And it's unfortunate, I think. Um, the I, I just, we all have bad days. I think uh, this columnist maybe had one. And uh, it's essentially saying, yeah, we're corrupt, but we're not as corrupt as Chicago or San Francisco or, and by the way, I, I think we are. Um, but uh, again, I see this as a deflection because uh, to, for the LA Times to really embrace this and go after it, is to admit that they've been asleep. Uh, Rick, how do you see that? Yeah, I see it. I, I, I don't know what, uh, I, I like. I have much to add to what you just said, Jerry. I mean, it's just, it, it's kind of in line with the other two headlines that we saw though, that, you know, corruption is just, this one now, it, it's not just that it's, um, uh, you know, uh, too bad that corruption is depriving us of our stability, too bad that uh, corruption looks like it's going to hurt our, are supposedly, uh, you know, forward moving homelessness uh, 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 initiatives. But but now it's um, eh, it's not really that big a deal when you come down to it, because in Chicago, they used to gun people down. And, you know, I mean, it just yeah, I, I it was it was so bizarre. <laughs> I, I'm going to take a slightly contrary take on that. First of all, the headline's atrocious. Um, I thought <laughs> Miguel Pat wrote it. I think the LA Times. Do you been, write headlines? Do you write headlines? <laughs> you don't. We spend so much time going the forward website. We spend so much time thinking about headlines. Yeah, yeah. And we individually write them because, especially in the digital age, there's nothing more. You know, you're competing with everybody. 
and there's nothing more important than the headline. But the New York, the LA Times, I think it's still in the print mindset where, you know, they figure people have the print in front of them and they're going to read it no matter what. So <laughs> I, I, I am astonished how bad that, that headline's incomprehensible. Be that as may, I'm also a big Pat Morrison um, fan, and I think her beat is a little different than it's not really fair to criticize a Pat Morrison piece by the same standards that you're critic, you know, by the same. She's not a beat reporter. She's not a politics reporter. She really is focusing at this part in her career on kind of the historical perspective of L.A., which is one of the things I'm fascinated by, too. I'm. So you go to Pat when you want to kind of get this kind of long view of where does this moment of corruption fit into the history of L.A. corruption. And I was a kid when you already was um, mayor. So for me, that piece was like, oh, man, he was really I mean, I always got a scummy feeling from him, but he was really terrible. So, it, it you know, it does put it in perspective. And the takeaway I got was that you know, we've got to change the trajectory or that there's there's something wrong with this trajectory, not that it's OK because it's always happened. So I, I got a different takeaway. I very much enjoy her. Um, you know, we live in it. L.A. suffers from a lack of a sense of history in place. And we you know, and I think that one of the one of the gifts that Pat gives readers is she returns a sense of place to L.A., um, which is this very ephemeral, you know, for most people, it's this very ephemeral, transitory city. So, so I, I, I just have a different take on it. You know, she, she makes a comment in this column that um, I think I, I'm guessing we would all agree with. Uh, civic power is so flabby and diffuse that it's hard to pull off a truly magnificent swindle. But I, I would <laughs> say that in itself is the form of corruption that there's this, uh, you know, everything is so diffuse. It allows, it'll, it, 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 first off, it allows small time chicanery. And maybe if you add up all the small time chicaneries, it comes to one big time chicanery. And, and it really does inhibit uh, 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 addressing issues. And, and you know, who's going to take this thing, you know, shake it by the collar and, and, and make some change? I think you're absolutely right. right. You're right. It's, it's the swindle is we're not getting our money's worth out of our politicians because because power is diffuse. Yeah, they can't get away with bazillion dollars of corruption, but they also don't do any, you know, don't do enough. Um, and, I, and I think that's the big swindle. I'd suggest another view of it. And I think... Uh, you know, that story, the Times got hoodwinked on that. But I think in Los Angeles, if you look at what was supposed to happen and then it doesn't happen, okay, and look at the outcome that actually did happen and who that actually benefits. And what you're going to realize is they didn't really want that outcome they sold to happen anyway. They actually got exactly what they wanted. In, in, which, it's, in which specific case are you talking about? And just in general, anytime you see a program that looks like, oh, that sure blew up or went off kilter or that didn't deliver what they said, look what it delivered and look who benefited. And I think you're going to see that it's a lot easier to say, oh, those bureaucrats blew that program than to really count where to follow where that money went and who benefited. And I think, I know that's kind of a broad thought and deep thought, and but I think that was what that column should have looked like at rather than saying, ah, oh, you know, it's just a diffused power structure and everything just evaporates, essentially is what it said. You know, so we can't get hurt too bad, but we're never going to be that good because everything just floats out in the atmosphere and is it evaporates into this diffused. Well, it's also a call for looking, you know, looking at the power structure and, and you know, not, and maybe thinking we need to reconsider how power is allocated in among our politicians. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so uh, worth consideration in any case. Uh, let's go on to the next headline and to be uh, now we'll get away from the LA Times. This is uh, from and in fairness, this is from a podcast that Ezra Klein did, and it's very different to as as we're experienced right now to be speaking rather than the thoughtful process of writing. Um, but I was fairly appalled by this. And there's a quote in here where he talks about uh, L.A. had they passed these huge measures to uh, address homelessness and they had these big plans. And then they just sort of didn't, uh, which I found insulting uh, from to, to be 
delivered that line from a, a journalist. Um, the uh, and then there's some attempt to, uh, I guess, explain it away that there's community opposition all over the place. I really thought it was just such a soft pedaled uh, approach. I, I I was astounded that that and that that appeared in the New York Times. Um, I was astounded by that. Uh, were you astounded or surprised or how would you react, Rob? I, I'm going to plead the fifth on the, I did not, I, I didn't see that. I didn't hear it. I didn't see it. Maybe um, Rick has a better take on it. Yeah, I was, um, I, I'm, uh, I guess I shouldn't be surprised or astounded anymore, but uh, uh, yeah, it, the so, it, it's it being astounded at, at the softness of it. And it kind of leads me because I, uh, when you think about it, two really major figures in LA politics um, stepped, uh, you know, uh, uh, are, are stepping down or did step down in this past year. One is, of course, uh, the mayor, Eric Garcetti. The other is Austin Butner, who is a superintendent of uh, LAUSD. And in both cases, uh, again, uh, there were these these columns in, in the LA Times, one by um, uh, one of Rob's favorite columnists, who we've already mentioned, um, mm -hmm. Uh, and not Pat, the other one, and uh, uh, and and uh, on Garcetti, and then an editorial on on Butner, and they both kind of they have great legacies because they presided over things. They presided over COVID, or they presided over the homelessness crisis. But if you read these these two tributes, there's really they didn't accomplish anything. So they were kind of in place. They didn't accomplish anything, and then there's excuses for why they didn't. In the case of Austin Buechner, his great accomplishment was that in COVID, he fed a lot of the kids. He fed the kids. He didn't, there's no evidence he really fed their minds. I mean, it's not like uh, uh, the, you know, performance at LAUSD is any better now than it was, uh, you know, b before he came on. And in the case of um, uh, Garcetti, you know, the columnist left it to um, a local critic, uh, Jack Humphreyville, to kind of list all the things as far as budget and poor services and the, and the, and the homeless problem and, and, the, and the potholes in the streets and all that, none of which, uh, you know, improved. But it was kind of dismissed like, well, this wasn't it's it somehow uh, how could how could anybody be expected, you know, to solve these things? And uh, uh you know, um, and then then uh, uh, in the column on Garcetti, it also says city halls ingrained pay to play culture and recent corruption scandals haven't directly entangled Garcetti. I don't see any of that as a big part of Garcetti's legacy. So, you know, maybe you should see it as a big part of the guy's legacy. You know, yeah, I don't know. I I don't know. You know that this is part of his legacy that, you know, uh, not, nothing approved. Yeah, I, I generally I'm sorry uh, for ranting. I'm sorry for ranting, Jerry. That's all right. I, I generally enjoy Ezra Klein's, uh, and I've seen him speak, and, and he's a, uh, an intelligent fellow. Uh, uh, I thought that one was just a little bit of a drop ball. And uh, what, what, was he saying? Was he the one giving, or was he reporting on other people? I, I'm a little confused. I, I guess I'm taking the role of our audience now because I, I didn't get to it. But was he saying that, or was he reporting on other people saying it? Well, you know what? Let's let's. I think Rick was citing something else. Gary, could you put that back up again and I'll read it? Okay. So now we got, uh, and let's keep using LA as an example because it's the one I'm more familiar with. So LA where Eric Garcetti has been the mayor, although he's now off to be ambassador to India, they did some interesting things. I mean, they really have been trying to work on this. They passed a huge measure which raised a bunch of money and they were going to build all this shelter. And then it just kind of didn't. I think it's built less than 10% of the shelters that it promised to do because the local communities keep organizing, sometimes through lawsuits, sometimes just through organizing to stop them. Um, I, I just find that to be, you can take that down, Gary. I just find that to be a unacceptable short yeah, again, again, it gets to this thing on. that these these, these public officials, they can be lauded, they can leave legacies, but they can't really be expected to do anything. In other words, Garcetti had some really interesting ideas and this was an interesting thing, but all of these forces working against it, so it just didn't work. When you mentioned Jack Humphreyville, we did a, at the forward, we did a piece looking at Garcetti's legacy and um, 
you, we had a very hard time getting anybody to speak on the record against him, even though people were happy to complain or have, you know, express pro serious problems with what he did, you know, off the record. The only person who would speak on the record was Jack Comfortville. <laughs> and, God you know, and part of that is because, you know, when it comes to L.A. politics, it's a small town. And especially it's a one party system and everybody kind of recycles. And if you were, you know, so so you can't, uh, you know, <laughs> you don't know if Eric's going to come back as the next county supervisor or, you know, what. And um, I think people were just leery of going on the record, uh, saying anything negative. But, uh, you know, I, I, but yeah, I, I think especially when it comes to the New York Times that you could do a whole separate show, Jerry, on. The New York Times reporting on L.A. Yeah, I suppose. I, I will say that sometimes I think uh, well-intentioned reporters actually understand their beat a little too well and or they understand their, their beat so well that they will write shorthand and they'll forget that, you know, uh, if you sat down and spoke to Mr. Klein uh, about that particular sentence, you know, he might unpack a whole understanding right. that he summarized. But, you know, let's be conscious of that because I thought it was a great disservice. Um, and again, we all have bad days. And that was, again, a podcast, a little more difficult than sitting and writing and revising it and everything else. Yeah. Um, now, this next one, Rick told me he thought it was a little bit of a cheap shot. And Rob told me he's got a different view of it. But my point is, on the day, and I, I'm not, I shouldn't laugh because this is not funny. Um, on the day that, uh, it was, it became public that a former dean of USC was indicted along with council member Mark Ridley Thomas. This is what the USC public information office was sending out. And it, to me, it strikes me as an indicator of a weak civic fabric. Uh, it just keeps sending out those releases, just plow through this and you know, so on and so forth. Rick, why don't you start with, is that a little bit of a cheap shot? Yeah, because I think uh, this is just I, I mean, you know, one of the things that USC does, it's a uh, uh, you know, it's a it's a major university and uh, they put out they do studies and they put out information. And I think that's, you know, it's a uh, 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 useful or at least interesting information. And so just just because there's scandal going on and, you know, in another part of the university, I, I don't think you just throw up your hands and, you know, uh, stop doing. Uh, in other words, the, the, the drones continue to work and churn out the product and, uh, you know, life goes on and, uh, you know, the. Uh, the <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to get a little bit blue and go back to the neighborhood a bit. And I'm not going to turn it over to Rob who has a different perspective, but I think to send this out an hour after your Dean, your former Dean was uh, indicted. All I could tell him is don't piss in my ear and tell me it's raining. <laughs> yeah, that's all I got to say. And that's from the old neighborhood. But uh, <laughs> anyway, Rob, you have a different view and some experience with USC. And I think it's- Yeah, I taught, I taught there. Uh, I, I taught a course there uh, over a couple semesters. And um, my experience was Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, teaching there is so, you know, on the inside, to the extent I was on the inside teaching, I had the most amazing students. I had superb support at every level of the administration. Um, a fantastic dean who's um, who is um, I just <laughs> um, Willow Bay, Willow Bay, but also the person right right beneath her. Um, I can't remember his name right now. Um, the students were truly inspiring, diverse um, from all over the world, not just all over the country, all different socioeconomic levels. Um, interested. Um, I, and, and I was comparing notes with somebody who taught the same course at UCLA and it was night and day. I mean, they just, they, they had a pretty miserable experience given, you know, the resources, the bureaucracy of a public institution. I mean, even though I think UCLA is great. Um, so, you know, and while you're teaching at USC and meeting these tremendous students and having this great time and taking advantage of all the other stuff going on on campus, you're hearing about this hell storm at the top, um, this kind of, literally corrupt, immoral, um, uh, you know, just rotten regime at the top of this place. 
but but you know down below where the where the plebes live it was it was pretty glorious and i just think um you know it's kind of what rick it, it is what rick said this is a massive institution it's a city unto itself it's almost a country unto itself it's got you know, the large isn't it the largest landowner in Cal in los angeles the largest employer in los angeles there's a lot of things going on and um you know depending on where you touch the elephant it feels very different um, which doesn't, by the way, I'm not excusing anything. I'm just saying, so, you know, whoever sent that out, it's a, it's a, those kind of, those parts of USC work and there's no reason they shouldn't keep working. And there's, you know, I know people at the Viterbi school, it's one of the greatest in the world. They're doing amazing things that, you know, if you need something in medicine, you go there for your, for your treatments. It's, you know, there's all sorts of great things. I hear they have a good football team. I don't know anything about football. <laughs> not this year. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, you know, uh, institutions like that have to walk and chew gum. And, and the, the disturbing thing is the people at the top who are doing this should really be ashamed for destroying the reputation and abusing the trust and the faith of people who are doing the great stuff there. Rob, also, would you just take a minute and tell us about your, your, your classes, the kids in the class and the first generation kids? And yeah, it was a large point there. I, I taught a class <laughs> called Food and Media, uh, Media, Food and Culture. And so it was through the Annenberg and but it was open to the entire student body. So I had students and, and because we talked about food, we got very connected to where people were from in the world. And they, they talked about the culture and their food. So I had people from China, people, um, Taiwan, um, Dominican Republic, uh, Eastern Europe, um, just all over the world. And when I was growing up in LA, USC, the, the image of the USC student was kind of a blonde, waspy, rah, rah, cool, you know, athlete, not very bright, but, you know, his parents bought his, way, bought his or her way in there. Um, I didn't, that, that was not my experience at all. I mean, just the opposite. It was felt like the UN and, and, and um, in the best possible, like a very functional UN. Um, I think that's, that's worth noting. And uh, you also mentioned that a lot of first generation kids and a lot of those kids are on scholarship and that costs the university money and that leads to fundraising and it's worthy fundraising. And sometimes it gets bent out of shape. And that obviously has happened at USC. But you know, so fair is fair. A lot of good going on there. And, uh, and, and by the way, that study did have a good headline. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they should hire the people at the Annenberg to write their headlines at the LA Times because that was that headline actually got me interested in the story. There you I go. Was on it. And on that, uh, well, I also say that you know, on that note, I will. I think you you fellows did a good enough job of uh, uh, counterpointing me. That Gary, let's take the last item off, so we won't run that one at the end of the show. I had another USC one, and now I'm thinking it's enough. So you know, if, if, if I can make an, uh, an observation, I, you know, I, I'm not sure there's been any university that has had more big controversies than USC from oh, that, the football that's program with, with, their, with, with the football program and then with the medical school and things that were going on. And uh, then with the uh, they were they were front and center in the admission scandal where you had, you know, parents, uh, uh, you, know, knows, all, yeah. it, it, you know, we don't have to get into that too much but no but all of those all of those and it's again it's not to excuse it but trying to explain it that it's just the amount of money that is involved in universities and the imperative that these schools have to raise money and it's it starts with the chancellor or the president and goes down to the deans and the departments and even to the club coaches you know uh Everybody needs to raise money. I, I really do believe university the universities are a huge bubble and it's starting to pop. And I, I think that this next generation of kids are not the, the uh, what are they, the Z's. They are not uh, going to be as enthusiastic, nor will their parents, about making sure you get into Harvard or Cornell or whatever. I think they're going to see, hey, two years at the community college, just fine. We'll go somewhere else. And, uh, you know, so that, that's my own opinion. Hasn't happened. But I was saying for 30 years that athletes should be paid, uh, you know, the college athletes. And it finally happened. It finally happened. So oh, maybe so I'll right. be right in 20. Well, I think I, I think the Harvard and Cornells will always be Harvard and Cornells will always have. It. But but a lot of the other liberal arts colleges, the mid 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 time 
you know, you're paying fifty thousand, sixty thousand dollars for not a Harvard or Cornell. I think that's going to fall mm -hmm. away a lot of that. Um, mm -hmm. But we were talking a lot about the LA Times earlier. We can't forget that it was the LA Times that really exposed most yeah. of the yeah. big stories that, yeah. uh, of USC. I mean, they basically set up offices there and um, basically and everything team, we know about the there is yeah, yeah. the LA Times. Yeah, I, I would All love right. to see set up an office on homelessness. Uh, of that yeah. kind of, of that kind of thing. <laughs> Credit where due. And right now we got to cut to a message from a sponsor from another university in Southern California. Gary? There's something that calls us here. To the edge of a coast. To a place where big ideas are born. At Chapman University, you will experiment boldly. Act thoughtfully, live beautifully, explore tirelessly. And when the world asks you what you can do, you will answer anything imaginable. We're back. I'm bring the, the panel back, Gary. There we go. And, and we have gone on a bit here, so we're going to have to wrap up fairly quickly. Uh, Gary, let's skip... Uh, to the oil spill headline, if we may. And I want to ask Rick from your Orange County perspective. I saw this, more than 100 mallard ducks released after delay due to oil spill. And it dawned on me that that was on page B4, or it was buried in the, the Orange County Register. Um, it certainly was a lot different than those dramatic disaster headlines in the first few days of the spill. I know you've been tracking this. Tell me what you think of it. Well, <clears throat> maybe maybe it's reading a little too much into it. Uh, but, um, you know, good news goes on B4. And the bad news goes on A1. Um, but but it is in some ways, this spill is a good news story. You're not going to hear that reported. But the point is that this oil spill that occurred uh, uh, very early uh, last month in October uh, off the coast of Huntington Beach, uh, it turns out it wasn't nearly as bad as was feared. The original est estimates were something like, I think, uh, depending on the source, 126,000 to 141,000 uh, gallons of, of crude oil, uh, which, which again was a fraction of what that 1990, the famous spill in uh, uh, Huntington Beach was, but, but something very frightening and substantial. Many headlines about the economic impact, the, the potential damage to the economy, to the coast, uh, some suggestions uh, uh, that you know the uh, operator of this oil, uh, the the oil pipeline was a uh, you know a, a, a bad actor, and that the uh, CEO uh, might face criminal charges and all this kind of thing. And now it's turning into quite a different story. First of all, total damage about uh, I think twenty five thousand gallons is now the um, uh, the estimate. I'm not minimizing it, but 25,000 gallons basically would fill up two backyard swimming pools. Okay, so it's not like uh, you know. And there were there was some some tar balls on the beach. I think something uh, around a hundred or fewer animals, birds, and and a, a couple of mammals, uh, uh, sea mammals, uh, were uh, were killed. Um, but it's not. I would argue it's not a disaster. It's a bad thing. Uh, they shut down the last day of the air show. I've yet to see a story. Maybe I'm just ignorant, but why do you have to shut down an air show uh, if you're cleaning up a beach? You know, I don't know. Can you keep people, you know, a certain amount, you know, like you only go this far on the beach or you stay on the sidewalk? I don't think the planes, I don't think, you know, I, I'm just saying. I'm just saying, you know, I never saw like, why did you have to so, shut down? So should that story about the... So, what I'm Should story have been on A1? What? Should the oh, story no, no, about no, no, I'm saying, uh, being uh, better? Uh, should that have been probably on A1? Not, but maybe on A1 or maybe in a column somewhere, somebody should say, you know what? This really didn't turn out. We, we dodged a bullet on this one. We, well, and we, also we, now the CEO. And, and, and the truth is, in some ways, things worked. It turns out that this uh, pipeline company had inspected the pipes for the last two years. And, 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 you know, a lot of people were watching this. I don't get a sense. And again, it's a political issue. There is huge pressure in California, very understandable, to shut down these oil rigs entirely. And this will be more fuel to do that because this was an unpleasant experience. Uh, but in a way, if you're going to have oil rigs out there, 
if this is the worst of it, and remember the reason it happened, it wasn't because of any faulty lines. It turns out probably that our supply chain crisis is the reason this happened. You got all these boats out there, yeah, got, you know, in, in places there. that they haven't, they're not used to being. And even though this stuff's all mapped out, you know, uh, somebody screwed up, uh, uh, an anchor dragged, twisted, and, uh, you know, caused a, a pipe to rupture, and which very slowly leaked very slowly. So there, you know, there's just, uh, you know, I think that overall, especially in in here, I'll give a kudos to the Orange County Register. They've done some good follow-up stories and they've, they've kind of explained this organization. I wrote it down. I'd never heard of this, the National Response Center. That's the hotline that people call. I do have some questions about that, but uh, the Marine Exchange of Southern California, which is like air traffic control for, for the ships. You know, and uh, so it it was kind of interesting stuff and sort of explaining it a little more. So you get more of a sense, you know, sometimes stuff happens. It's not so much someone's a bad guy or somebody's incompetent, but stuff happens. You've got a hundred ships floating off, uh, you know, off off the coast and something happened. Lee, Rob, how do you see it? Well, I was I was curious because Rick knows so much more about this down there than I do. But as an outsider, I wonder if this has um increased political pressure like if it's led to more movement down there against I think, their yes, I think a republican rick weren't you saying a republican has called for the shutdown of no the- actually uh it, uh, it and you're rob rob of course you're an editor and right away that's what you, and you're absolutely right this is a big political issue um i don't think you're going to see much opposition from either republicans or democrats at this point i i, I think i think republicans in california will be very able to pivot of how they want America to have inter- energy independence, but they're not going to stand up for uh, oil platforms. And I think they'll just punt to the feds who control that. So maybe the Biden administration decides to try to do something. I, I don't know. But, um, uh, uh, you know, so but uh, yeah, oh, certainly in the uh, uh, in uh, a swing, di- what's now, of course, in Orange County, Orange County's got swing districts now. They're all swing districts. Harley Ruda, who won the prior election, lost the last election for Congress. He's already calling for, you know, the shutdown of the uh, of, of all of the oil. And Michelle Steele, who defeated him, she's the Republican. She hasn't gone that far. She hasn't gone that far. Uh, what she's uh, I, I'm forgetting now what she's calling for, but but she's uh, something. Oh, I know she wants she wants to move all of the ships even further away. And somebody said, well, if you move them that that far, you know, where where are they going to go? Basically, like, you know, they have to go somewhere. And her response was just not in Orange County. Take them (laughs) out of the Orange County waters. Basically, I don't care where they go. It's almost like the homeless thing. I don't care. where they go. Just take them out of the Orange County. So so she's arguing for that. You know, she's not saying shut down, but I'm sure that's going to be a political issue. I'm sure Harley Root is going to use that. He wants to shut down all of these oil rigs. And I don't know what position, well, you know, other uh, what re, re, and uh, all the Democrat politicians are saying that we'll see how the Republicans uh, play it. Well, here's a point I, I want to ask you. Do, do you think I'm crazy? Because one thing I noticed about this coverage was all the coverage cited gallons. And in my experience, oil is always spoken of in barrels, which is a very, very different measurement. Um, and a smaller instance, measurement. Were they using smaller were they using, measurement. Were they using gallons to get a bigger number for the headline i i don't know i, I mean I, I i don't know how much a barrel of oil is so i i mean for me as a reader i could i i know a gallon i don't know what a barrel is yeah so it would, it would put it, it would fix it in your mind a little better like when rick said it's too so you know when rick was saying how many gallons i was translating that into how many gallons are in a swimming pool and then he said you know so it's and then he said it's two swimming pools but i you know but i, I think it just fixes it in your mind better now, you know, right. I did not see anywhere. Good point, Rob. I didn't see anywhere anybody try to put it in the same Yeah, to give that, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, and I, I might be wrong on that. Maybe somebody did, but, you know, was it an area, you know, uh, as big as Costa Mesa or just, uh, you know, an right. yeah. some, I mean, some I, kind I, of I mean uh, it just seems to me that, I, you know, as California's economy went from extractive to service economy to a tourism economy to a real estate economy, Oil wells are on their way out. I mean, there's such, you know, whether it's 25,000 gallons now or 125,000 gallons later, that's just a twist of fate. 
And, it, you know, any amount is unacceptable if you own coastal property that's worth, you know, gazillions of dollars or if you depend on tourism, which all these places do now. So it, it seems to me that we're just in the, you know, in the waning days of all this. And these oil rigs are old, too. So I think we're literally in the waning days of it. All right. I got three more here that I want to get through. So, Gary, you want to bring up the conservative one? Uh, it was a weird scenario in a country accustomed to contradictions. Mexico is at once rich and poor, tolerant and conservative, lowbrow and refined. Um, this is a tweet. I know Daniel. He's a, he's a fine guy. Um, uh, but I, I wonder about the juxtaposition of tolerant and conservative. And uh, Daniel, by the way, is a, a staffer with the LA Times. And this had to do with a story he wrote for them. Um, just real quickly. Is that fair? Is that a mistake? Is that one? If, if you wrote that, would you delete the tweet? Which part of it do you find? That, are you taking exception to, Jerry? The juxtaposition of tolerant and conservative. Oh. Is there any conservative left in this person's view that might be tolerant? Is the, the Supreme Court Justice uh, the, you know, uh, Roberts, is, is he a tolerant man? because he's widely known to be conservative. And I just wonder, are they really mutually exclusive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you delete that tweet? You know, I don't know what the LA Times policy is on tweets from its reporters. And I, is Daniel a, an opinion? Is he on the opinion side or is he a reporter? No, he's, he's a reporter. And Daniel's a fine journalist and a good guy. And uh, didn't he run, is he, he ran LA Taco for a while, right? Yes, and now he just recently has been pulled into the, the food page on, I think, an oh. interim or, you know, so good for him. And I think he's been very busy lately. But uh, yes, I, I, I would, I, I don't know that I would tell him, to, I, yeah, I, I would point out the problem to him. Right. Rick? Yeah, well, yeah, obviously tolerant and conservative and also lowbrow and refined, you know, uh, it, it, you know, couldn't be, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, working class and refined or, uh, you know, I mean, I think he's talking about kind of, you're either right. right. Yeah. I mean, that was, um, and, uh, could you, could we, uh, there was one other thing I wanted to comment there. It was just that, uh, the closing, uh, what the, uh, the closing line there, um, it is proud of its pre-Hispanic, uh, millenary history, yet still unable to reconcile with it. And I'm thinking, OK, so he's making the point that I, I guess that uh, Mexico is a lot like America. And I'm wondering, is there anywhere where people reconcile, you know, past histories and past wrongs? I mean, in a way, it sounds so profound, but that's everywhere. You can go to any country and, and find, uh, you know, a, a pre a prehistory that's hard to reconcile with what's going on. And that's what history is all about. And that's, you know, uh, uh, but it used to not. It used to be something that we could study and talk about and reason about, but now it becomes this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, sort of Damocles or something or some way of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, just uh, uh, causing guilt and, and everything else. And I just I, think it's... Uh, yeah, I do remember reading the article that he based the tweet on, and I thought it was uh, a really interesting interesting piece that he that he had you know first that they had assigned it to him and then that he had that he had done that there just needs to be more reporting from mexico that's not about drugs and narcotics yeah and, and daniel literally wrote a book about mexico or mexico city so maybe just maybe like tweets like headlines should be done with yeah more. maybe and, and, but if we're yeah. going to devote this show to you know poorly written <laughs> tweets we'll be we'll be here all night Listen, uh, Rob, don't don't bump into any copy editors. So, <laughs> guess guys on the way home. The uh, Gary, you want to bring up the next one, uh, please? This one irritated me personally, but um, what does it say here? Nine other incidents evenly involved anti-Catholic, anti-Muslim, and anti-Christian sentiment. This is from some time ago in the Orange County Register, which essentially says Roman Catholics aren't Christian, which is a little bit offensive. Um, Rob, the forward's not, I guess, uh, and you can describe it better than me, not necessarily a religious uh, publication. It's not a religious publication, but it certainly is informed uh, by a culture steeped in a religion. Um, your perspective 
from a, a broad on the Christian versus Catholic thing there. Well, yeah. I, I think it was just lazy wording. I, I, I know what they were getting at. They were talking about Christians who aren't Catholic. So it could have been against evangelicals or Jehovah or, or um, Mormons or just that whole broad group of Christians that aren't Catholic. And uh, it could have said I, Protestant, maybe. Is maybe, a, but I don't know. If, I don't think I don't know if even Protestant covers it. You know, if you really, you know, once you start trying to pull out every denomination that it. Yeah, I don't know. For instance, that a, I I I know that a a Mormon is Christian. I don't know if they're Protestant. Yeah. So, so yeah, there's all kinds so, of landmines there. So it's one of those things. Well, I know what he's talking about. It's not the most careful way, but I don't think they're trying to make the point that Christ the Catholics aren't Christian. Right. I, I don't. I. I wouldn't think that they were trying to make that point. It just offended me as just uh, a, a lack of understanding generally about a, you know, an, an important or a sizable segment of our society. Uh, yeah. But it also points up to me that uh, our media generally is just not comfortable or good at covering religion for the most part. Um, how, from your experience with uh, the forward and with the Jewish journal before that, and just kind of, Looking from that perspective, is is that a fair statement? Is it just are are we mostly just clumsy and how religion is? Yeah, going? it's fair. It but uh, if you grade on a curve, it's gotten a lot better. And I think the big difference was nine eleven. I think after nine eleven, hmm. uh, media companies started to see that you know religion actually is important and uh, it, it it motivates people and it and it causes real things to happen in the world and. Um, there were certain papers like the New York Times that always had, and the LA Times always had a religion coverage, but, you know, Teresa Watanabe did it for a while. She did a great job. Um, Lori Goodstein at the New York Times. But I think it became, everybody started taking it much more seriously um, after 9-11. You know, and, and is it important? I mean, if you think covering abortion is important, covering corruption in the Catholic Church, covering... Uh, you know, fundamentalism, um, even what's going on in schools right now with what books people can read and what they can't read. A lot of this comes out of these values that are grounded in, a, in a, you know, a Christian understanding of the Bible. So if you don't understand that, you're not understanding what's motivating politics. You know, it all comes, politics is a function of belief and belief doesn't necessarily mean religious belief, but it means some kind of belief. And I think that you have to, you know, when you peel back the layers of how people behave in the public square, which is what journalism describes, um, so much of it comes from a set of belief values. And, and for many, many people that comes out of organized religion. And for other people, it comes out of inchoate values that they basically got through the, you know, the religious culture they grew up under, whether they realized it or not. So, um, yeah, it's super important. Pay, I, I remember reading that CNN, um, when they started after 9-11, they started a, a religion blog. And I think their goal was to get 2 million readers at the end of a year. That would be success for them. They got 82 million. Wow. So I think not only is it so important for understanding why people do the things they do, um, you know, but it's people are really interested in it. I mean, I, I know that from running a Jewish paper that a lot of non-Jews would read and comment on. And I know that now working at the forward where there's a lot of non, you know, we get over 2 million people a month sometimes on the website. That's not all Jews. Aren't, there, just aren't that many, <laughs> there just aren't that many Jews around. So, uh, it, you know, it's, it's interesting to readers, uh, but it's also really important if you want to understand how society functions. And uh, now NYU has religious studies a separate track in journalism. Um, USC, I know Annenberg has a, not a I don't know if they have a separate track, but they do have some courses in it. So I guess, I guess I'm going to have to wrap up. So I'm sorry, we're not getting to get to our last one. Uh, I've just been told there's 42 gallons of oil in a barrel. Um, and I think we'll leave it there. Fellas, thank you very much for your time and insights today. Great. If we've uh, learned nothing else. We've learned that 42 gallons in a barrel right. of oil. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't time it very well. I'm sorry, but uh, we do have to wrap. Thank and you, Jerry. Absolutely. Great. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Rob. Right.